uh, good morning. Um, I would like to start first the, with the common factors that are at play in political and economic transition uh, with respect, uh, especially reference to South Sudan. I identified eight common uh, factors and I categorized them into two, three primaries and then five secondaries, secondary factors. The first three are injustice, inequality, and when the injustice and inequality in the society lead to ethnic tension. And that's what the three, I would say, and they lead to violence. So you look at the violence as a secondary common factor as a result of the primary ones. So in South Sudan, there's tension um, between two ethnic groups, the Dinka, which seem to be the largest, they are not necessarily the majority, but they are the largest within the 64 ethnic groups constituting South Sudan. And the second largest is the Nuer, and there have been conflict between the two where the Nuer feel or whether real or perceive that they are being denied since, a, for, since 2005, but you can go back since the conflict started in South Sudan in 1983, where the Nuer felt that they should also lead in the set of the Dinkas always leading. And after independence from Sudan in 2011, the Dinka continued to lead the country. And the second person was from the Nuer, but they kind of dissatisfied with that. So that led to what I would say, uh, violence. The second is the, within the, the secondary, is justice, where again, that ethnic tension, people feel that there's no justice prevailing in the society. And there's also institutional dimensions when you have weak institutions, whether institutions in the security sector, in the economic sector, in the justice sector, if they are weak, then people feel that they are not being served. So that is the third dimension, and then the economic foundations, whereby again, excess resources, certain groups feel that there is dominant or they are being denied to have access because of they belong to a certain group. And if, if the, 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 the fifth one in the secondary common factors is the capacity of the state to act um, or to respond, take preventive measures before the crisis set down. So those are the, the what I would call eight in the case of South Sudan. And let me look then at the why recently, about two, two months ago, uh, in July, um, this year, after one year of peace agreement, which was signed on 26, 25, 26 August 2015, and the government took time, almost nine months, for the government to be formed after their peace agreement, and then three months into the formation of the new government of national unity, conflict erupted again. And what I would say here is the way, and uh, it relates to the role of the actors. Uh, some, most of the South Sudanese analysts, including the, the signatories to the agreement itself, felt that this particular peace agreement was imposed on them. And actually there was an earlier attempt because the conflict arose within the ruling party called the SPLM, Sudan People Liberation Movement. And this is where the conflict started. In 2014, uh, through efforts of CMI, with the ruling party in Tanzania, 
and the ANC in South Africa felt that let us resolve first the conflict within the party. But unfortunately, some powerful actors in the international community felt no, they better go for the peace agreement between the warring parties outside the party. And what I would say, the powerful, the, the Troika, uh, that's the US, UK, Norway, and they have a special envoy, we were supporting the negotiation in Addis Ababa, while the party intra-SPLM party arrangement was taking place in Arusha. And the, the South Sudanese themselves felt that we need to sequence first. Since it was a political disagreement within the party, let us resolve the unity of the party first. But then the, the, the other actors who were supporting the peace agreement being initiated by IGAD in Addis Ababa felt that this was a, a delay, will delay the process. And not only that, they felt that the SPLM was already a dead monster that must be buried and forget about and move. Now, so what happened is the, this particular peace agreement ignored the, the call for unity of the party and it got imposed and call it agreement for the resolution of currencies in the Republic of South Sudan. And the way it was structured is built in crisis because you have the first vice president who is coming from another party who, is, who was fighting and given a number of ministries. But not only that, if he's, if he's out, outside the country, he appoints one of his ministers to act for him. If the president is not in the country, he cannot act. It will be the second vice president who acts. So you could see inbuilt conflict. And that's why the, the, the agreement, uh, the, uh, the conflict erupted again on the 8th of July. Um, and the first vice president fled the country. Uh, there was a rift within his party. Uh, they replaced him, but then the conflict continues. So in, I will not talk about other uh, experiences, but in, in Africa, in, and especially in the case of Sudan and South Sudan, I think external actors, mediators, they need to sit back a bit and try to understand the cultures of those in conflict. And it is not because I'm sitting in the panel of the CMI, but I thought the CMI approach, which was also supported by Tanzania ruling party, which because Tanzania, South Africa, they are not nervous to South Sudan. So there's no immediate conflict of interest. While they got countries that are the neighbors of South Sudan, there's immediate con conflict of interest in my view. And so CMI approach was the, in my view, was the correct one because it addresses first the root causes instead of addressing the systems, the symptoms of the conflict. And so the responding to crisis, in my view, requires a correct diagnosis of the crisis itself. We need to understand what are the root causes or the common factors at play, as I have already mentioned, the, the eight of which three are primary in the case of South Sudan because of ethnic tension is the primary factor at play, and which also affects both political and economic. Because it's political, the fact that uh, the, 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 the people who are ruling, they belong to a different ethnic group. It is also economic because the group feel that they are denied access and due to tension. Thank you. Thank you very much, and well, for my part, I have to say that even though this crisis may, may seem very different, different with it, each other, they also have some common ground, for instance, the uh, power struggle and, and struggle uh, and fight for uh, resources. For instance, in the case of, of Ukraine, you can see also the uh, struggle for, uh, especially in the energy sector. So, uh, Jokan uh, Yasar, do you have some quick comments on that? Um. I think, from my 
can see is that you know there are core factors uh, that are, are common across a number of, of conflicts. And uh, while Dr. Deng was speaking, I, I wrote down the ones that immediately ticked my list of my experience of conflict. And that was, you know, a number one, that, and I will talk about it in my comments, is uh, weak institutions, uh, which is a fundamental, uh, absolutely fundamental reason why conflicts occur and why they are then difficult to resolve. The second one is definitely economic justice, uh, and in some cases, it's a perception of economic justice, not necessarily that there are terribly difficult different income levels. That depends on the crisis, but certainly there can be a, a, a concept of it. I think the third one is the capacity of, of the state um, to respond and prevent crisis by recognizing the early signs and the possible direction that those early signs can take in terms of, of escalation, and if you fail the Ukrainian situation certainly is if you fail to respond quickly to to et, to this escalation question, then then you end up with uh, a full blown uh, conflict as we have. Thank you. I think uh, I I would just have a quick note uh, on a very fundamental, in my opinion, point that was uh, addressed by uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Lowell and that is the issue of addressing the causes rather than the symptoms. And this is something based on our experiences in the region is fundamentally crucial to uh, uh, basically take into consideration because it's much easier to uh, follow the symptoms, uh, thinking that you're solving problems and then realizing after all that it's simply you know, uh, has been a waste of time process and waste of efforts. And a quick example is, for instance, now in the region where I come from, in the Middle East, one of the biggest uh, problems uh, is corruption. So many people address this issue thinking that, you know, they have certain ideas and strategies to tackle corruption, forgetting that corruption is a symptom rather than a cause. And uh, in order to tackle and solve corruption, you need to tackle and address the causes, which so many governments have failed to do so, so far. So I think it is very important to highlight this uh, uh, point, this fundamental point, and make sure that it's not uh, only highlighted and, uh, and taken into consideration at a, a hypothetical level, but also uh, within the level of uh, you know, implementation of any uh, policy actions or strategies with regards to conflicts.